Poppycock Podcast with Victor Pacheco. We got a really great show for y'all, but before we hop in, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Long Beach Comedy, which takes place at Harvell's in downtown Long Beach, California, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we have award-winning dancers, celebrity drop-ins. You never know who's going to be there, but I'll tell you who will be there. Me, your boy, Victor Pacheco, every single second and fourth Tuesday of the month with new material. So come and check me out. Come and check out the shows and check out this awesome episode with my man, Mr. Donald Lacey. Hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to Poppycock Podcast with your host, Victor Pacheco. I'd like to introduce my guest for today, a very special man, a very funny, hilarious comedian, headlining comedian. You know, you've seen him on BET Comic View. You've seen him on HBO Def Comedy Jam. You've seen him on TV, Hanging with Mr. Cooper. You've seen him in Blood In and Blood Out, Jack. And you've probably seen his one-man show, Color Struck. Why don't you give it up for my man, Mr. Donald Lacey? What's up, homie? Look at you, man. You just slimmed down. You got the beard working. I'm proud of you, boy. You're doing your thizzle. Thanks, brother. Thank you. I really tried my hardest, man, you know, especially like in this town where they judge you and how you look like, because apparently this big, colorful purple shirt ain't enough. <laughs> and so, you know what I mean? Being hilarious ain't enough. You got to have gone viral on TikTok. You got to right. have a TV credit or you got to be a celebrity. Other than that, get the hell out of the way and make room for the real stars. Motherfucker, right. I am a star. Just right. I'm just like there one of those stars, that, you know, you got to see with a microscope, but still. And I'll just, <laughs> I'll just mess it around now. I'm talking, I'm talking to a really good friend of mine, Donald Lacey. Like, seriously, Donald has been really, really cool. He's been really influential in my comedy journey, my comedy career. He's been awesome. For, I met him for the first time ever. Must have been 2012, 2013 at the Underground Pub in Redwood City, which was upstairs, even though it's called the Underground. But anyway, you know, us comedians perform where we, where we perform. And the, the lights were so bright and the room was so dark. When I saw Donald on stage, I thought he was a white guy talking black with a black scent. And, and, and then like, and I'm like, holy shit, this is the bravest white comedian I've ever seen in my life. But then I met him after the performance and I was like, holy shit, this guy's just light skin. That's easy, he's a wet I like it. That's Spanish for light skin. Anyway, so like, it was just like, that's fine. Like, and, and so, no, because I really thought somebody was doing the black scent. And I was just like, dude, this guy actually sounds like a black dude. Like, this for real. So like, it was, it was incredible. But, uh, but the thing that stands out in my mind the most, and I don't know if you remember this, but uh, years later, after I met you, we did this show at Shug's in yeah. Daly City, California. And there was some hitters on that. Hitters on that show. Hitters. Hitters. And me. And uh, what was it called <laughs> at the time? You know, I wasn't really that, you know, like confident in my abilities. And um, I had this, I had the best set of the night that night up until Donald Lacey comes up and schmurders it hard. And here's the thing. Shugs is a black room and they yeah. even hated the black comedians. They hated the Mexican comedians. They hated the white comedians. They hated everybody except for Donald Lacey and Victor Pacheco. For reals. Like, eh, like I got three Hennessy's purchased for me. I mean, for reals. They like me. <laughs> they were cool. They were fucking around. You know, they didn't just kind of like me. Give me Hennessy. You got to like them to give me Hennessy. That shit's at least $14. At right. least. At least. But, you know, so it was just like one of those. But the funny part was for me was that uh, this was one of those shows that was just like there was hella comics on it. And everybody had a chance. And like Donald goes up there at the end of the night and they're already tired. They already want to go home. You know what I mean? Like, everyone want to go home. That <laughs> Donald goes on stage and he murders so hard. Bro, you were up there for like two hours. No joke. I remember that night. Two hours murdering, murdering murdering and i'm like i can't even go home because i just did this crowd and i just watched all these great a the best of the bay comedians just die die so i'm just like wondering you know like as a as a comic who's trying to learn the craft to get better 
what's this dude doing with this audience that was, that's more tired right now than they were when I was on stage? What's he doing that's so special? The thing was the way you related with the crowd, the way that you just really just didn't care, the way that like about like if they liked you or not. You even called them out at, at the beginning. It was pretty funny. It was like one of those things. I'm like, oh, well, if that's how you're going to confront somebody, that's how you confront somebody. But you know what I mean? But it was, you know, it was all in love. It was all in love. It was just taming the crowd, you know, making sure that, you know, they knew what your expectation was and you ain't going to deal with this shit. Well, you didn't say it like that. You said it more eloquently. But you know what I mean? When it comes to comedy, you know, I really trust your advice. I really trust trust everything with uh, your your level and experience and everything, man. Like, so it, it's just it's been, I mean, I remember we did a show in Oakland and afterwards we went to a, we went to go, we went to a jazz show. Ah, oh, that's right. Yeah. So I was just like, you know, so me and Donald ain't just casual friends. We, hey, we, you remember who was there that night and you were like, yeah, you remember? Dude, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I remember. And you were that. like, dude, all right, I'm going to tell you. He no, said, I'm, dude, is that fucking Phil more slim? Dude, that I was said, Yeah. And then I went over there and then you went over there and hollered at him. He's like, dude. Feel more slim is in the building. I was like, yeah, man. Dude, that's that, how I roll, baby. Dude, that was crazy because it was it was funny as fuck because we had just done the whitest show. Right, whitest right. show. And then the, the dog's like, hey, what's up, bro? You wanna go to a you wanna go to a jazz concert? I'm like, hell yeah, do I wanna hang out with a funny ass dude right now? Yeah, let's go. And they got food. Double hell oh, yeah. yeah. Let's go, oh, baby. Yeah. So then we went and I was like, what? Everybody knew Donald. It was hilarious because I'm just like, I'm a nobody. Like, and everyone's like, hey, Donald. I was like, Who, who's that big Mexican guy? I wonder if that's his security. <laughs> it's got to be security. That's got to be, you know, that's got to be security. Hilarious. There's there's no way that's anybody else. That, you know what? what who is that? You know, uh, that's just security and shit. Stupid. Or, you know, or it's translator, so he gets the best Mexican food when he goes gets Mexican food. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what people were thinking? And, you know, a lot of black people don't even call me Mexican. They call me Mexican. <laughs> like, I'm a mess. It's like, man, you don't even know me yet to know that. But once you find out who I am, you'll know that you were right. I am a mess. But anyway. Yeah, but what was so cool, they knew you was with me. So everybody was like, hey, what's up, dude? Because, yeah. you know, that was my spot. In fact, the lady... The late that was uh Everett and Jones is where we were at, and uh she passed away uh earlier this year, man. Shout out to Dorothy King, she was she, always the homie, man. But yeah, man, we all rest that, in peace. you know, so funny. You I remember because we were like after that white, white show, we were like, man, I was like, dude, I gotta get around some black folk, man. Come on, <laughs> roll with your boy, man. I got like over whiteness right now, and I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you know that first story you told, you know what I remember that uh, night at Shug's, but it was like, we said it to each other, it's like, hey man, you know, we the only ones, I said, you killed a young fella, and he said, yeah, you killed him. And we were like, you the only one to kill, yeah, I know, you were the only one to kill. So, <laughs> Bro, no, no offense no, to anybody else, but uh, you know, no names, was, no names. I grew up in them kind of crowds, man, that's a real black crowd, and they met, they, they find out if they like you in the first 10 seconds. Ten you got 10 seconds. seconds you. 10 seconds, so you know. If we no, don't no, like no. you in 10 seconds. We don't want to hear none of your little jokey jokes ah, and all that old ah, bullshit. Ah, but you, you, we, they be like, okay, motherfucker, let's go. What you got? And then once they love you, they're like you. They embrace you. They love you. But if they ain't love you, man, they're going to give you the, the wooden side of a nickel and tell them kiss my ass, pretty much. Dude, or worse. Worst. The worst, you know what the worst thing a black a black audience member could tell you after you had a shitty set, which you probably haven't had a shitty set ever or, or in I had decades. A few. <laughs> Everybody does. I didn't have a few. <laughs> oh man. No, but I know what you're gonna say, but let the audience hear it. No, but the audience, the worst thing a black audience member could tell you, worse than you suck, don't lose your day job. What the fuck was that? You know what's worse than that? Man, you did your thing. Oh my God! <laughs> just tell me to quit comedy and just, just, just stop. Because telling me I did my thing, ah, that's a nice way of just saying, you know, all the bad things in life. But you know what I mean. But it was eloquently put. Because you know what right. I mean. For for real though, because like 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 white people will be like, oh, I'm gonna give this comedian three jokes, and black people are like, I'm gonna give you ten seconds. 
Right, right. So it's right, just right, like, right. Like, so it's right. like true honesty. And like, I did a joke recently that I released on, on Instagram, a little clip. Pretty much the gist of it is just that, like, you know, that all these people are pissed off that they remade The Little Mermaid and The Little Mermaid's black and all these white women are pissed off. But the real people who should be pissed off is black women because it's not even believable for a black woman to get her hair wet and still be in a good mood. That's funny. <laughs> but bro, I thought of that joke. I was just thinking about it like all the times, you know, it's just like, it's just like, how come you don't want to go out? Because like I substitute teach too. And you know, these black girls in Oakland, I'm like, how come you don't want to go out? I was like, oh, I get them hair wet. I get my hair wet. And I'm just like, and then I like, it's, it's just the, the, the law of attraction. I started hearing that a lot that week, even from adults, it was a rainy right. week. I do stand up, you know, I don't do just stand up with just Mexicans. I don't do stand ups with just white people. You know what I mean? I, you know, I mix it up. So like, you know, I walk people to their cars because even though I'm a six foot two and I'm a scary looking dude, I'm a safe comic. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of creepy right, ass right. comics. So I will walk women to their cars. Now, if they try to mug them, I'll make sure they only get mugged and nothing else happens. Yeah, let them take the take <laughs> shit. I ain't going to fight for you. You know what I mean? But like, you know, right. just, 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 just give them your purse and I'm going to make sure that nothing worse happens than that. Just give up your purse <laughs> and you're going to reimburse everything I give up in my wallet. OK, so that's all I'm saying. But, you know, uh, going back to, 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 to stand up, man, like, you know, you've been doing it for, for a long time. You've been in the film. You, you, you were hanging with hanging with. With Mr. Cooper, that that is just amazing. So, um, doing comedy and everything, like, uh, well, first of all, I forgot to ask you this question: How you doing today? Man, <laughs> man every day I wake up, bro, is a good day, and I really mean that because you know I'm over sixty now. A lot of cats I came up with is gone on to wherever they went. You know, it's a lot of debates about where you go, and I ain't trying to get religious and spiritual. But one thing's for sure, we all got to make that trip now. Where we go, that's the great debate. Heaven, hell, you know, maybe if you've been a shitty dude, you'd be in a long line at the post office. Who the fuck knows? I don't pretend <laughs> to know. All I know is, bro, all we got is right now, right here, I'm kicking in with you. Yep. And again, let me say, man, I'm really proud of you, brother, because I remember it's only been a year. I, you know, I first moved to L.A. in 92, and... First show I ever did, Michael Collier, you know him, right? Michael Collier used to have this room. <laughs> and I had a hoopty. I drove up to, I come right off 580. I mean, I had a hoopoo, 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 hoopty. And they used to have <laughs> valet parking. So I was like, I was trying to find out, and you had to park the valet. It was nowhere you could park on Sunset Boulevard. It was right across the street from the then Roxbury. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> So not too many people saw him park my ugly hoopty. In fact, my car used to backfire so much, backfire so much. My mother used to say when I pull up to her house, "Hark, I hear a cannon." That was like her favorite line. <laughs> this is how <laughs> shitty this car was. So, bruh, one of my Latino brothers, yep. ese como esta amigo, was the valet. So I'm waiting till the very end. And it was all these beautiful <laughs> babes. Everybody's dressed. You know, I got all my little shit. I just changed in the bathroom, took a whole bath, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm hiding in the bushes, bruh. I'm going to wait till everybody gone. And for some reason, my vato loco decides <laughs> to cut my shitty car in front of the line with everybody. And all I remember hearing was women saying, damn, whose fucked up car is that? <laughs> And I'm hiding in the bushes, oh, no. and the essay sees me and goes, hey, amigo, hey, amigo, your car is here. <laughs> and he goes, oh, so, no. dude, I had to do the walk of shame my first night in L.A. in 1992 oh. and get oh. into my oh. shitty car. And as I try to pull off, it stalls out. Bro, oh, no. Oh, no. So the Mexican guys have to push start me. Oh, my all, God. All I remember was looking in the rear view and it was like the Def Jam laughter. All the women were like, ah! <laughs> so that's my first <laughs> night in LA story, bro. <laughs> True, story. True story. Oh my God, that's that's hilarious. But also probably at the time was not hilarious. No, probably man. Super I, didn't, I didn't go out to, for the next two days and my then man was like, hey, bro, yeah, everybody heard about your shitty car, but get your back ass back up on that stage. <laughs> Ah! It was all over LA. This motherfucker's car ain't shit. And bro, this was before Facebook too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What no social Dude, media shit. Did that? Shit. People, <laughs> people, people, literally fucking dialing up. Hey, hey, hey! You hear about Don Lacey? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He was he's on he was on hanging on he was on hanging with, with Mr. Hooper because he drives a hoop tee. That was <laughs> hanging with Mr. <laughs> We're gonna start calling him hanging with Mr. Hoop tee. I nah, just fucking around, bro. Yeah. Ah. Man, I was I was catching. I didn't even have money, bro. I was trying to catch a ride with everybody. I didn't take that car out again except one time I had to. And uh, yeah, that car died a, a, a horrible death. Thank God. <laughs> oh my God, man. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, especially, well, so did the humiliation that went with right, the car too. Right. So it's just like, and I feel you, man, because like uh, my mom uh, used to have a 1977 Mercedes Benz. There's those, those yellow old school Mercedes from the seventies that say diesel on the back. It was one of those. I remember those joints. Yup. It was exactly <laughs> like that, except it wasn't a diesel and dude, there was something wrong with the belt. So every time she dropped me off and picked me up at school, <laughs> super loud, super loud. So I knew when my mom was there and I'm just like, fuck, I'm going to wait inside the classroom until I could hear her. And then um, because I even told her, I was like embarrassed. I'm like, mom, I appreciate you picking me up. But like, hey, you think you could pick me up on this street instead of the right, front street right. right here? Here's the front. And here's the side, and I want you to go one street over over here. So I'll just walk over here, and then you, you can pick me up there because you know kids are really making fun of me. Like, and I beat the shit out of two of them. So like, <laughs> I can't do anything about the girls making fun of me. I mean, they already don't want to fuck me, so I'm just gonna you know want to fuck. I have to, I have to beat up the dudes that make fun of me and you know set a precedence. So like, <laughs> you know, that was just like me trying to you know keep it real with my mom and you know. But luckily for me, she did care and she knew that, you know, it was like, you yeah, know, man. like she cared about my reputation. Well, I mean, cared about what I cared about my reputation. She don't care. She's like, me, huh? You're lucky that somebody picks you up in a car. And I'm like, all right, mom, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know everything was horse drawn where, where, when you grew up because she literally grew up in a ranch in Mexico. So it's just like, oh, wow. compared to what I, oh, I'm so embarrassed about a loud ass car. It was like, Shit, she wish she wish she was able to be in a car when she was my age at that age when I was exactly, like eleven or twelve. Bro. But when you're eleven or twelve and you're going through those hormonal changes, right? It really right. matters what girls think about you, and if they think your mom drives a hoopty, they probably think you're a hoopty too. So right. it's just exactly. so so that's pretty pretty crazy. So like you know, you you being a professional comic and all, and with the with the. These I, obviously being on television, you got to be clean, not the deaf comedy jam on HBO, but like with the BET comic view, you got to be you got to be clean. So I was wondering, as me being a dirty comic, do you have any advice for somebody like me who's transitioning to become a clean comic so I could do okay. professional gigs? So far, I got 15 and clean. Yep. I got 15 in Spanish. I got like 35 or 40 in English. And so I'm like trying to work myself up. You know what I mean? And so like, I'm just trying to ask about the clean comedy. Do you have any advices on how to write clean? Yeah, man. First of all, funny is the number one rule. You know that. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, I got, <laughs> this is funny. I got the reputation of being too dirty and too black. Get that, because I was, you know, I was talking about black issues, and even black promoters were like, "Man, yeah, this dude is funny, man, but we don't need no messages. Fuck that. We need to be drinking and doing cocaine. We don't want to hear about how the black man got it hard." So I was always trying to give you some food for thought. So then, when I realized at, at, at a point until I started producing my own shit, you know, that yeah. I could say whatever the but I wanted to say <clears throat> that I had to cater to who, you know, because you want to work, right? Definitely. I mean, <clears throat> so I can do church shows. One of them, I remember the show when I was living in LA. This was in the 90s. And it was like a real popular church in LA at the time. And a comedian friend of mine, um, he was like one of those church comics. He's like, bro, you're funny, man, but I got this good paying gig. And, and back in the 90s, it was paying like 250 for a 30 minute set. And that was like, you know, what? yeah, that's like 1500 now, <laughs> right? For yeah. a 30 minute set or even more. So I was like, dude, okay, I'll do it. And I remember I was, this was the first time I just, I didn't do one square word, but a couple of times, man, I was almost dead. I almost said, mm -mm. I was biting my lips so hard, bro. I had blood running down my cheek afterwards, but I did it. I did 30 minutes of clean and they were cracking up. And then it taught me something. It's like, 
you know, is back then. I don't do it as much as I, I did this roast for Dave Stewart last week, and it was hilarious. And it was the first time in a long time that I did I did what I used to do, which is memorize every word of my set. Because, you know, Ricky Henderson was there, all these great days. Mark McGuire was there. Tony La Russa was there. Oh so I was God. like, you know what? I got to, of course, always riff. I always, you know this, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. do one set where I don't riff. And that that's a <laughs> tribute to the great Warren Thomas. A lot of people don't know who are watching this. Google Warren Thomas. You can find this shit. He was one of the funniest guys. Anybody who comes from my generation of comedians knows. Warren Thomas was the comedian's comedian. And I'll never forget, he was telling me one time, I was doing some material and it was going over all right. Then I just started riffing. And I did like a 30 second riff. Then I jumped off and I, I could see him in the back, it was in a theater in San Francisco. I could see him in the back pacing, right? Yeah. And then afterwards the show, he did his thing and killed hour or whatever. Backstage, dude fired on me, pow! Not hard, but like, bro. What the fuck's wrong with you? I said, what, do you, what, man? I did all right. Nah, dude, you had that riff and then you jumped off. He's like, let them jump you off. Squeeze every drop out of that riff, bro. Squeeze that rag dry. Just keep going. You, you stopped right in the height of a riff and then went back to your material. He was like, fuck your material, bro. That's what comedy is about. When you make a connection with the audience, whatever that is, you ride that horse till it dies. And I, that was a valuable, and man, that has served me well. Because if I go on a riff now, I'm going to stay on it. You know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And you're yeah, great man, at it. I learned some, but, uh, you know, in terms of being clean, bro, just write it out really good because you're going to have to do the same thing when you do TV. Like for Comic View, what was it? Five minutes, three and a half. I forget what it was, but you had to have it timed out. So you had to write every word. And then again, if a riff comes up, I'm going to take it, swing and miss. If I'm swing and miss, so fucking what? But I'm going to swing for the fences. <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's the other thing about riffing. I've seen him. He was the one dude I learned from him. And that's why, like, when you were saying, you were saying some cool things about me, but I learned from some of the best. I got to work with Paul Mooney. You know, all the really great ones, they don't give a fuck if you laugh or not bro and they're yeah. not afraid if you don't that was the biggest lesson for me because i was like oh shit there's a lull in my set oh god they didn't laugh now they don't laugh fuck it, fuck <laughs> it. Fuck it. that's your issue not mine i know this shit is funny <laughs> i don't know maybe i'm talking about erectile dysfunction and you got a limp dick so you might not find that funny oh well sorry buddy get some viagra and come back tomorrow night and you'll laugh so you can't really worry about you know and you got to always had a good sense of humor and i remember i first saw it i think you remember i came to i said bro you're funny but you just just keep being you don't trip i said it might even take you a little longer don't trip on fuck just do you you remember that i remember that yeah i do and i told you bro because you're gonna stand out because you you already knew early in the game who victor pacheco was you know yeah and as and as a peachy wet on, let me tell you, I said, <laughs> <laughs> Mira aquí, papi. <laughs> you got it popping, Cobes. Bro, I mean, I just, you know, I I take every, listen, I listen to people that are funny, that are guiding me in the right way. I don't, li and then I'll even listen to people that are, that like, because obviously you're like at this top level of you know having had all the years of experience having the tv credits having film credits having television credits so you know you're the man you've proven yourself and you keep proving yourself and so it's just like you know to get advice from somebody like you it means the world to me because it's just like i'm gonna listen to that i'm gonna hold on to it because i always got that little voice in my head saying is this is this right for this crowd and then, you know i need a little bit more donald lacy in my heart and be like man fuck this crowd man i'm funny as fuck they're gonna like this shit <laughs> Because it's hilarious, and if they don't got it, they don't like it. That's a fucking problem, you know. Maybe they don't like fat Mexicans. I'll tell you one thing: I've been to fucking Ukiah where they were racist as fuck, <laughs> and 
And they hated my ass, but I made their asses fucking laugh hella hard. And I embarrassed the fuck out of this racist ass dude who was with two chicks on one side, two chicks on the other side. I'm like, listen, bro, you've been heckling all fucking night because we're the only fucking people you're going to talk to after the show because none of these chicks are going to talk to you, bro. And no one's ever going to suck your dick because you're a fucking asshole. And then, like, everybody started fucking ah, going crazy. And I was like, hey, look, look to your left and look to your right. Your so-called friends are fucking laughing at you because they know they ain't going to fuck you tonight, dog. How does that feel? How does it feel that a guy with big tits like me is going to get more pussy than you tonight, dog, without paying for it? How does that feel, motherfucker? Because I was pissed, bro. I drove three hours and the show to get there an hour early and the show started an hour late. And then they, they were like, oh, you're, 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 you're closing out the show. And I'm like, man, if I'm closing out the show and I did all this shit, no. I'm not doing 10 minutes. You give me 20, 25, 30 minutes. You're not giving me no, I'm not doing 10 minutes. So like, fuck it. So I did like 25, 30 or something like that. Right. Which isn't that big of a deal or whatever. Right. But I was riffing most of the time and I was doing anti-Trump jokes. I'm like, boo, boo. So I, so, so I told some dude, hey, hey, bro, don't boo me. Blow me. All right. And then so like I wasn't taking no shit. And then like, I got a couple of bookies from that, actually. And out in the middle of nowhere in like a treehouse style. T- it wasn't a treehouse, but I mean, I'm just trying to like simplify what I, you know what I mean? With a restaurant downstairs and then the bar upstairs, the little tiny stage. When, when you said treehouse, I saw your big ass climbing up a tree. <laughs> I'm a gorilla, bro. I'm a gorilla, bro. I'm a gorilla, bro. Dude, I am a gorilla, man. It's fucked up, man. I even got a joke about that man like you know these mexicans are fucking like just like really really mean bro like if you got big ears mexicans will nickname you conejo because that's spanish for rabbit and like and if you got big teeth if you got big buck teeth mexicans will nickname you conejo which means rabbit and hey bro but let me say about what you just said this is why we always connected because again i've been in the game 30 years whatever and I feel like I know nothing. I'm still a student. I still go to open mics, bro. I love the craft. And I always liked about you. I could tell you were serious about the craft. You wanted to get better. And then, you know, like a lot of younger comics, you know, they think they know shit already, man. And they got this entitled pissy at And I don't give nobody advice that, you know, I gave you advice because I said, man, I like this dude. He's He's got a future in the business. And then you were receptive. Because a lot of these young cats, and I always say, hey, man, can I give you a, oh, oh, man, I don't need to hear shit. Yeah, whatever, old motherfucker. Your credit's as old as my, you know, my old pair of shoes or whatever. Whatever. Okay, cool. Fine. But you were always like, dude, you would come to me, bro. How was that said, bro? Do-do-do-do-do. What can I do, bro? Do-do-do-do-do. And I said, okay, I'm going to take this guy under my wing, so to speak. Whenever I'm fucking with him, you know, I want to help this kid because, He's serious about the craft and he ain't got no ego where he thinks because, you know, like you say, man, they, they got TikTok and all this bullshit, whatever. Somebody get so many likes or whatever. They think they're the shit, you know, and unfortunately, the business has changed so much where you got to have X amount of followers and likes and all that. Old yeah. bullshit. Some clubs will even book you. And I've, I've been to a couple of those shows with these Internet superstars get on stage and they got a headline. <laughs> They barely got 10 minutes, let alone 45 to an hour. Good luck, asshole. Get up there. <laughs> I'm not hating on them because it's not their fault that the promoter booked them, right? That's right. on the promoters and the that's, club. Yep, yep. But that's the nature of the business now. So whatever, I get it. I think but <laughs> I'm saying that to say you were always about the craft of telling jokes and how can I be a better comedian? And that's where I am. How can I was when I do a set, I always I record my stuff most of the time. And I say, well, how could I have done this better? How could I be better? Because it's always, it's never you get, I'm there. No, you're still on the journey, or at least it should be. Right. Because you know what? Because I, I also teach, I, you know, I, and, I, and I tell my students, listen, you can't be a know-it-all. Because if you're a know-it-all, you already you already know everything. So therefore, you can't learn anything new. And that right. stops you in all facets of your life, not just in the classroom, with your relationships, with your friendships, with your employment, with every facet of life. It affects you if you're unwilling to learn. And like, you know, students will give me some BS like, oh, we already did this. I'm like, oh, cool. Then you already know how to do this. So just do it again for me so I could collect the paper and give you credit. You should get 100 percent. You already know how to do it. So let's do it. 
based on what you just said, I got a better answer for you in terms of a tip. Yeah. Be clean. <laughs> yeah. Just like you're talking to your students, because I'm sure you don't cuss around them. I don't. It's See, that's I have, it. That's it. Think about yep. it. It's like I'm talking to my students, so I got to be clean. <laughs> right? Bam. Or I gotta add it. I gotta add an extra word, a couple of words. That I'm gonna pretend that is some of my students that are respectful towards me, because there's a lot of students. Their main gotcha. objective is let's run this fat fucking Mexican out of the class, so we don't gotta do shit. Like for reals. Like I've gotten like let go from a position because the students made up a rumor about me that I said something racist, and I was like. What are you? You're really going to believe these kids over me? They're like, well, your position here has already been compromised. I'm like, my position here has been compromised because I told the students to put away their phones and take out a pencil. And it's June and students are asking me where the pencil sharpener is. For wow. reals, for reals, for reals. Emory High School in Emeryville, California, for reals. You guys have 60 seniors and there's 45 notes going to parents saying your child has less than a 75% in this class, which they need to graduate. And your child has, and I'm reading the numbers, the highest number is 60%, 50 50%, 50%, 40%, 32%, 12.5%. How the fuck you got a 12.5 in English in America? How the wow. fuck you get that? And it's just like, really? For reals? Like, you're like I, I've been a positive role model to these kids. And sometimes kids get really intimidated because they've never had a positive male role model in their life and actually care. And I write down scholarships and tell them that they could go to school for free without having to join the military, without, wow. ha without having a full academic ride scholarship. And I joke about how, you know, I know I look like a jock, but I didn't go to school for free because of sports. I went to school for free because I manipulated the system because the system is designed for white people to succeed. So once exactly. you learn how to read like a white person and learn how to take tests like a white person, you will start to be successful like a white person. And nothing pisses off people that are racist against non-whites being at the same level. Because to mm -hmm. a lot of races, we're not at the same level. And let me even take this further because I wanted to bring this up because you're an Oakland native, you're, uh, you're East Bay native, and I lived in Oakland for six years. I lived in Oakland since the, from like the age of like uh, 31 to 37 or something like that, or 30 to 36 or something like that. And prior to the first show, so for like 30 years, I legitimately thought black people and Mexican people we're on the same level with the struggle. It's fucking bad. We get brutalized. Is you know, people look at us all fucked up. They think we're gonna steal or beat somebody up or worse, or murder somebody or something, right? People have this prejudice against us. But then when I moved to Oakland, I realized that Mexicans do got it bad, but black people got it way fucking worse than black people. Because I have literally, I went to my weed dealer's house in West Oakland, and my homie hooks me up fat because I'm fat. And he likes me. So like anything over an ounce at the time is a felony. Mm -hmm. And so a cop pulls up right behind me. Right. And I'm scared out of my I'm going to go to prison. Someone's going to fucking molest me. It's going to be bad. Oh, my God. I don't even know what's going to happen right now. I'm fucking scared. Oh, my God. And then guess what happens? A cutlet, a cutlass pulls up right next to me with three black dudes with the meat. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. We're at a red light. Turns turns green, me and the, me and the car, me and the car, the cutlass. We 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 both go, and the cop that was right behind me er, gets right behind the cutlass with all the black dudes and starts following them. And I'm like, man, these racist fucking pigs. This yeah. is the this is the only time racial profiling's ever saved my ass. But like, it, it was one it was one of those things where I was just like, fuck, man. And they weren't doing anything. Like they like right. my car was the one that reeked like weed. It wasn't them. They weren't smoking a blunt or a joint or drinking in the car. You know, they were just listening to loud ass music and being and being African American in West Oakland. That was just one incident. That was just one oh, incident. Yeah. And it's just like I seen the way that the police treat black people. And it's just like, you know, like like even like when there's a dispute, it's just like, no, like somebody's in danger here. And now you feel you're in danger because you're a racist, insecure fuck. 
So like, uh, and that's shit I witnessed living in downtown Oakland by Chinatown. You know where I used to live. Oh and you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I dropped you off over there, come on. Hey, brother. Man, see that, that, and I talk about this in my show, Color Struck, right? Which I've been doing since 2006. But anyway, I grew up in the 60s and 70s in Oakland, man. And that's why the Black Panther Party for self-defense, which people always say Black Panthers, but the original title was the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And that was because the police were brutalizing and murdering Black folks. When I was eight years old, we used to live on 107th and East Fort, near East 14th, right? And there was a a block away from the crib, there was a, a, a laundromat. So we heard pow, pow, pow. We ran down there and I'll never forget, man, there was this kid, he could have been older than 12 or 13. Police blew the back of his head off with a, uh, with a shotgun because he was breaking in the coin machine, trying to get change. So imagine me, I'm eight, nine years old, whatever. And they dragged this kid out, white sheet over him covered with blood, you see parts of his brain. Oh my God. So, and the and, and a year or so before that, I'm seven, we used to live right by San Leandro, which was lily white back. In fact, Brian Copeland, a friend of mine does a show, not a genuine black man. We talked about, he. they were one of the only black folks in San Leandro, right? So I used to go to this drugstore, ride my bike, have my fro blazing, you know, <laughs> where I would get comic books. I was a big Marvel comic, fuck DC. Uh, the Marvel comics was the shit. Marvel DC for life. Was on some bullshit. But anyway, <laughs> we didn't like Superman's punk ass. Yeah. But anyway, so <laughs> I got pulled over by these cops, two white cops. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They handcuffed me. Seven years old, bro. What? Put me on the sidewalk and then went back in the car and had lunch for about a half hour, drinking coffee, giggling, laughing. So finally, man, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm terrified. I'm shitting in my pants. I'm scared. I'm crying. They Seven. come over. What they told me, and I was like, well, 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 what have I done? When they pulled me over, they said, you were riding your bike on the sidewalk without a permit. So this is the kind of shit, bro. So when you were black growing up in Oakland, you were, you were traumatized by the, the in fact, there was a, a survey that was done in the 60s the then mayor, uh, the cracker mayor, I forget who he was in Oakland, yeah. they recruited police officers from Alabama, Tennessee, and all of them to come to Oakland and serve. And it was proven that a lot of these crackers had Ku Klux Klan affiliations. So that's why, that's why the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was started, bro, because just like you saw, and man, it was like, you know, like George Floyd recipes and all this, this shit ain't nothing new. It's just now we got cell phones and stuff to record all this shit, man. But this has been going on since I was a little bitty. We were scared. Dude, to this day, I'm over 60 now. I'll be driving a police car pull behind me. My hands start sweating just because of my experiences as a little kid, bro. So, it, it man, it's always man. been like that. And Oakland was like the flashpoint for police brutality, bro, going back to the 60s. In fact, I'm a so funny quick story if I could tell you, and I, I'm still trying to work yeah. this as a joke. <laughs> True story. Yeah. A friend of mine was talking about his dad, his uncle is from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And this is like, he's older than me. He's in his 80s or whatever, like in the 40s, 50s, whatever. Police would routinely pull you over and jack you beat you up, maybe kill you, right? This is New Orleans, which has another uh, diabolic. So anyway, yeah. we're pulling over. He's in a, his uncle's in the passenger seat. The dude is driving. So the cracker pulls him on and says, hey, boy, you know you was spading. I'm going to have to give you a ticket. And they're like, yes, sir, no, sir. They're all scared. Said, so he gives the driver a ticket, then slaps the shit out of him. Then he goes to the passenger side of the car and slaps the shit out of my boy's uncle. And my boy's uncle said, hey, man, why you slap me? I wasn't the one driving. Because I know, boy, you'd get down the street and say, I wish that cracker would have slapped the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> True story, dude. <laughs> I got to do that shit on stage, bro. But yeah. Oh, my God. That is super intense at first. And I'm like, 
what's his punchline going to be? It better be great. It better be believable. And it, it, it just boom, 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 hit all the marks. Oh, that's, too- that's it. And that's a oh true fucking God. story, bro. That's a true oh story. Well, I'm true sorry. Story. I'm sorry that all that had to happen. And, and you know, and, and that that's what makes you a real comedian where you could turn something traumatic into something hilarious and it's just messed up because sometimes I'm just like feeling bad because I remember something that happened to me and I'm like wait a minute let me write that down so when right. I stop when I stop being a little emotional bitch about it I can turn this into <laughs> some comedy gold real quick you know it, what I mean that's where the gold is bro the true stuff yeah yeah because the traumatic shit guess what <laughs> somebody came up with that word because a lot of people experienced it and so right. that's why, you know, with trauma, with everything. And it's just like I wanted to talk about your one man show uh, and the full titles Color Struck Bridging the Racial Divide in America. It's a solo show about color consciousness and institutional uh, institutional racism. And so I don't want to give away any more details about the show. I don't want to burn. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, like no, it's all good. And so, like, I I just I just want to say, so what inspired you to do a one man show? Because you've been a comedian all these years and then you did a one man show. So how did that come about? Well, that's a great question, man. And it started when I was four years old in kindergarten. Uh, I got into a fight, got sent home because this black kid, you know, little kids. And I remember this like it was yesterday, bro. He goes, you're not colored. We were colored back in. This is 1964. You're yeah. not colored. I was black like, kid? Black kid? Sorry, my yeah, bad. Yeah, black, black kid. kid. All right, cool. I cool. beat his ass. Got suspended. <laughs> so I went home. And my mom was like, you know, like my daughter behind me was about her complexion. And my father was dark as your beard. I mean, my sons are dark. My sisters are dark. It's just one of them things. You know all them genes go somewhere in our lineage, a white slave owner raped my great great grand mom, but somewhere down there. This happened to a lot of us. Let's be real about it. Yeah, Jesus. So I was always, and I used to always get teased, like, because Pete kids would see my sisters, and then they'd be like, oh man, that ain't your real father. You were adopted. They dropped you in a basket. So it was something that was always. So then I go to San Francisco State and I get educated by Dr. Angela Davis, Dr. Richard Cream, Dr. Francis Cress Welsey. And I started to understand why black people would say stupid shit like, oh, you got good hair. And I, my joke is, what the fuck is good hair? Hair that comes home on time. Ain't no such thing as good hair. Any hair on top of your funky head is good hair, right? So why are we black? Why are we so saying all this ignorant, stupid? St- it's because of institutionalized racism, because from the womb to the tomb, you're taught white is beautiful and dark black is ugly. Look in the dictionary, Webster's white, pure, angelic. Dark, uh, uh, black, dark, evil. So from the time you come out of the womb, you're brainwashed that everything white is good. Cleopatra was white, which no, she was African. And all of this just so you're brainwashed to think everything, you know, the good guys wear the white hats, the bad guys. So all this little subliminal programming oh, makes you shit. think that if you're dark or black, you're less than. And that's why people who were darker than me always hated on me because they thought that you think you're better because you're lighter. But and actually, I hated my light skin. I wanted to be black as your beard. That's why I was so <laughs> radical when people say you're too black because I'll be talking shit. Don't ever think I'm not black. I'm black as Miles Davis on the inside. So I developed, So then when I go to San Francisco State and I started learning, there's a great uh, paper I'll refer your viewers to, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation. And that's uh, by the late, great Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, who ended up being one of my teachers. I got to spend a lot of time with her. I interviewed her on the radio several times. Oh, wow. And she broke it down. She said that when white boys got in the ships and they started to travel, they noticed that 86%, almost, the way majority, that's why they call us minorities, because in the world population, we're the majority and they're the minority. Everybody had something they didn't have, color in their skin. And she says this caused them to feel inadequate. So to uh, offset their feelings of being inferior, they set up the system of white male supremacy. And that's why they got to dominate the money, the education, the jobs, right? So then they started. So somebody could say, hey, Victor, you're racist. Hey, Donald Lacey, you're racist. No, we could be prejudiced, but racist means you have the sanctions of the society. In other words, I can't stop nobody from getting a job because they white. 
but you can do the same for me. I can't stop you from getting that housing that you want to be in that white neighborhood and say, oh, sorry, we already uh, sold this. No, they have the sanctions of the society to oppress people. That's what the definition of racist is. One moment. Uh, uh, that's theory. That bitch is, she heard racism. Now she's talking on my iPhone. One moment. <laughs> Where's she Get gonna... off you white how? You see but, it? But you yeah, know? man. So, so luckily, you know, my boy, Sean San Jose, about the locals forever, <laughs> said he came to see me do a comedy. He said, bro, a lot of your materials about race, bro, you should do a one man show. And that was in 2003. Oh, wow. And then he helped me shake, shake <laughs> she's laughing. She helped me shape, <laughs> he helped me shape the show. And man, it's 70% of it is funny, but in the end, <clears throat> hit him with the Mike Tyson and his prime, bro. We show the, I, I ain't got it an eye. We show the lynching slides to the, uh, show people burnt up and chopped up with Billy Holiday Strange Fruit. And at the end of the show, it's always funny. We have discussions, but everybody is so fucked up. Nobody can say anything at the end. They're all sitting there like this. And I always have to like, oh get my them God. To relax. And then the discussion. Man, we, I did this in front of, you know where Arcata is, bro? Up there near Arcata, the Arcata, yeah, water. yeah, bro. Uh, up past Eureka. Exactly. Yep. I didn't know that's <laughs> where they had white, racist, paramilitary Yeah, dude, and the most racist I would racist never tweakers. took this gig, bro. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, bro. 150 I... people, and there's only <laughs> one black person in the audience, a student from uh, the, the college up there. Uh, what's the name of that college where the good weed is? Uh, yeah, the college. Yeah, humble. uh humble. Humble. Right? And uh the discussion is going on, and this this white lady, all uh, 350 people, 349 of them is white, right? Not even no Latinos, no Asians, not just all white, bro. So the discussion's going on, and this white lady's got tears in her eyes, and she goes, You know, so glad I saw the show when I was a little girl in 1965 in the Watts riots. We were on the outskirts of Watts. And something, a brick came through the window and hit her father in the head. His head was bleeding. Oh my he was God. unconscious. And her older brother and her mom had to drag him. And then they drove to a hospital near Watts or in Watts. And she said, a uh, black orderly or doctor came over to attend to her father. And she's five, six years old, bro. And she goes, don't let that nigger touch my daddy. And then I thought, wow, this is the power of this show. This woman's been carrying this around for 50 something years. Oh my Finally, God. She wanted to confess. And then she started crying, man. I jumped off the stage and hugged her and said, thank Aww, you for saying it. But that's that's how we get past this bullshit because race is, is a man-made construct. There's no races. There's only one race, the human race. We have different ethnicities, different cultures, different shades of skin color. But the, the dominating powers who run this country want us to be divided as people. That's why they made up this whole race shit and white is good, black is bad, and anything close to black is bad, brown is bad, whatever, whatever, red is bad. That's all bullshit, man, to keep people controlled and separated. So that's what Colorstruck does. In the, and man, some of the discussions have been amazing, you know, because people want to talk about it, but they're scared. They don't know how to get into it. So that's what I help them do. I you almost made me cry, bro. I had to regain my composure like five times for the record. Um, that's <laughs> that that was deep. And you know what? That I, I thank you for sharing that because that's really dude. That that's so many things that like people don't want to talk about. You know, like for example, like it's just. It, it just strikes me so hard that like Tom Hanks is making a video about how he hadn't heard of the Toulouse massacre up until two years ago. And right. he's been to college and in high school and in middle school and elementary. They never taught it because those books are, are who, who, who wrote them. Right. Who, 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 who are they intended for? You know what I mean? We're, we are, the biggest colonizers we're, we're currently, you know, I mean, how many, troops are there across the world and it's just like thinking about everything that you're saying because not only is it deep not only is it factual i mean it's information that can actually change culture can change society yes. and i ever want and i'm wondering if he's i'm getting emotional as fuck you know like All good and, bro. I'm, and i even got i haven't even got to the emotional questions i was gonna ask it's for reals you know keep it on a 100 you know um uh, 
I'm scared for your life, dog. Like I, I'm scared the same way when I tell little black and Mexican kids that you could go to school for free without joining the army. Like, I feel like the government's going to take me out for fucking saying that. And like, I feel like what you just told me right now, which is just a glimpse into your into your one man show, which is beautiful. And I, I got to go to that next time. Like, I'm going to make time to go to that. I got to If I got to buy a ticket, I'll buy a ticket. Bro, in fact, and like, listen, come, I, no, fuck I, I, buying a ticket. When you come, I want you to do 10 minutes to open. <laughs> You're beautiful. Listen, I, 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 I love you, brother. Hold up. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. We got. We, I love you though. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for. And then you gotta say. Just, and then you can say when I first met this dude, I thought he was white. That's what. The <laughs> <laughs> hilarious, dude. That's hilarious. No, man. But it's just like, bro. All the points that you make, man. Like it's just like, are you ever scared that somebody? No, right? Or if you, or, you tell you, bro. To quote one of my favorite black leaders of all time, uh, Malcolm X, and, and when he says, uh, uh, if it, it, to, to talk about, he talks about how he, he was in prison and, and he was in front of the crowd and somebody, he said, I don't know why y'all looking at me like I'm fucked up because I went to prison. He didn't say fucked up, but he said, yeah. if you're black in America, you're born in prison. So in other words, what do you got to lose, man? I mean, hey man, uh, the great, the late great Paul Mooney, who I learned a lot from, not just about, and by the way, one of the most brilliant minds to ever. And then, you know, he was a, he was a race man, what, what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called a race man. In other words, you study this concept of race and raceology and how to break it down and, you know, oh my uh, God, the, the political structures that keep us oppressed and all of this old shit, right? And he used to say, the truth, brother, never needs to defend itself because it's the truth. So in other words, if I'm telling the truth, I don't give a fuck. The, you, you don't like the truth. That's your issue, not mine. So man, I'm only afraid of, 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 of the creator who made all of this. I, I, respect, I have a respectful, for not afraid of, ooh, but I have a respectful fear for the awesomeness oh, of, yeah. of her. I'm gonna say her. Of the black woman, the black woman is God, as my sisters like to say. They created all this. So, hey man, you know I, I really believe our destinies. A, a, a lot of it is preordained, right? You know, we 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 don't know our birthday, we don't know our date, our our day we check out. But in the meantime, man, I'm gonna do the best I can to reach people, to help people, to touch people, to make people think, to make them feel like a human being, and that's my mission on Earth. So where the chips fall where they may, and I don't even consider danger or none of that shit, man, because you know what I'm saying? But what I like about you saying that, uh, heaven forbid I get hit by a bus, you could, you're gonna be my conspiracy theorist, say, yeah, and the Ku Klux Klan was driving the bus. We saw him, he took off a sheet right before he got on the bus. Yeah, we saw him, so yeah. So either way, I'm a win. I can't I saw, lose. I saw the motherfuckers at Bed Bath & Beyond and they stole them sheets too. So they couldn't get targeted. <laughs> they couldn't get targeted, okay? <laughs> They're like, Hilarious. If, if we're going to kill this black man, we're going to steal him like a black <laughs> man. You hear me there, Cletus? Yeah, we hear you right there. Yeah, we're going to see him. Like, yeah, let's go to that. Let's get some fancy ones from Bed Bath and <laughs> Beyond. Let's go get let's go get us some of them special sheets there, them brother. That's hilarious. And so it's just like, listen, you know, it's just like fuck. Like, uh, how, how racist can I get? Uh, imitating racist white people. How about that? Is that how about that? Why? Do, and then do white people like that? Isn't that the goal? You know, what I, or are they pissed because I'm more like them? Like, you know, I don't know. I, what do white people want? And you know what? I don't give a fuck. You know what? I, I know what they want. They want me to shut the fuck up about being Latino. Hey, man, that's a great book title for you. What do white people want? Dot, dot, dot. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> or the next time, the, the title of my first album, bro. <laughs> oh, man, that's going to either fucking skyrocket me or fucking just push me down deeper than the roots of the fucking carrots and carrots and other fucking vegetables I'm going to have to pick once, once I get run out of comedy. 
Brady for saying shit like that. But anyway, any rate, no, my point being is this, oh man, listen, like there's so much funny, uh, because listen, I don't know how much time you got. I want to be respectful of your time. I don't know if it's I should have. Okay. I got some more time. Whatever okay. You want okay. To do, because we're on the serious talk. And so let's just, I, I want to do some serious talk and then go back to the comedy if that's cool. Or if you're done with the serious talk, we could go hey, to the comedy. It's your flow, bro. Whatever you want to. Okay. I'm wide okay. open, bro. Okay. Well, listen, since you're my brother and like, we'll, we'll just keep it on the, on the serious note because, you know, I'm like reading notes and I, you know, this is the thing. Of, this is what I hate about people. Listen. Like, you know, it's like, I respect you for you. And like, I, I think you're hilarious and everything, but it's just like, what do I know this brother from? What do I know? Because you have a very distinct look, bro. Very distinct look. And like, one of the things that I saw that like really like touched my heart was when I saw you on CNN on the Redemption Project, which is something that I asked permission if I could talk about this during the podcast. Because to be honest with you, even though you did share it on national television, I wanted to make sure that it was okay to talk about right now. Maybe, Absolutely. you know, maybe it was okay when back then to talk about it then. Maybe not so much right now. You know what I mean? I want to be respectful. So I want to talk about the Love Life Foundation. And I wanted to talk about how, how that was created because so far everybody knows how passionate of a person you are and that you got a good heart just listening to you but a lot of people might not know that you have suffered a lot of personal tragedies and i, I want people to know this because you're not a bitter person you're a happy per i'm sorry um it's all get, good bro sorry brother it's just speaking from the heart I'm See, very, this, is, yeah. this is why uh, Victor Pacheco is mi hermano para vida ese. Uh, <laughs> lo siento, mi español está muy así, así, pero necesito practicar todo el tiempo about locals forever. Hey, look, man. You could do a comedy Spanish show with hey, that man, level I, of I Spanish. Need you to help me work that listen, out, bro. Hey, listen, bro. We'll do a trade because friends don't charge money. But <laughs> and listen, you tell me what 30 minutes you want translated, dog, and I'll find out some because, yeah. okay? Listen, Bet. yeah, dog. Yeah, dog. Let's, let's make listen, it happen, trans, because listen, there's all the time to translate it and then actually teaching you and then making you like, ah, like really, ah, like, 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 like English, it's you, but it's bad. Ah, 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 ah. That's hilarious. Don, 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 you know, it's so fucked up. I'm like, Don, let's get really serious. Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my brother, no, dude, because like, I, I want, because listen, Donald Lacey, I didn't know this about you. And then I found this out about you. It didn't change nothing. The only thing that changed about me with you was just like my heart grew bigger. Like, like I was just like, I never knew that this type of forgiveness existed, especially. And so I don't want to. So so I, I don't even I don't even know how to bring it up. But Donald all good, man. suffered a very man. tragic event in his life. And no, that's all good, man. To see you see her behind me, right? Beautiful, yeah, man. Beautiful. Well, the, uh, it started in 1981 uh, uh, when she was born, and I was just a young pup, just starting college. Mm -hmm. And I was with her mom, mm -hmm. right? We lived together. Her mom had two other children, was pregnant eight months with the third when I met her. He's my son, you know, not my birth son, but he's my son. Yeah. And I live next door to her. And then her little daughters, who were so beautiful, man, they used to come over. They'd want to play with me. And i take them to the park. <laughs> and her, you know, her mom, you know, my daughter's grandmother. And I started helping out. Anyway, long story short, I drove her to the hospital when uh, she, I was there with her when she delivered my son, right? So then... You know, I was living with my pops at the time, rest in peace, and we wasn't that cool. I'm 19, you know, I had just got out of jail, whatever. That's a whole nother long story. Uh, in Fresno County, by the way, yeah. and there, uh, in fact, Fresno County Jail was like 80% Latino, and I'm always been black, bro, but I was kind of perpetrating. Simon has said. <laughs> I, they had the numbers on this dog. I was like, what the locos, you know? Hey, como estas, amigo? I was... <laughs> si, 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 entiendo, senor. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, I got you, bro. But, um, so then, you know, me and my pops had a little dispute, and he put me out in the house. But anyway, I had been living in my little hoopty car, the same one I drove to L.A., right? But it wasn't quite a hoopty back then. Um, and I ran into her 
at the grocery store. And I hadn't seen her in a couple of months. She goes, hey, where, what happened? I said, hey, man, possibly I'm living. She said, no, you're not going to live in a car because you helped me out when, you know, I was pregnant and this and that. Come stay. You can sleep on our couch. So this went on and she was a beautiful woman with a perfect ass. Best ass <laughs> on planet Earth. And that's with all love and respect. My Sorry. baby's mama, bruh. Yeah. In fact, this is this dude. <laughs> so then we got romantic, started living together. I love and you, then, uh, we had been living together about a year and I had this dream. I wasn't going to live past 25. And I told oh, her, I said, I want to have a baby. And I saw her in a dream. I said, it's going to be a little girl. And she said, are you sure? I already got through. And I said, no, please. I'm not going to be here long. I got to have this baby. So she was playing. But my, my baby's mom, oh my Bertha, was, her ass was so cold. Summer, one time <laughs> before she's pregnant, we're walking down East 14 and she had on some short shorts. And this cool, real OG drove by and all of a sudden he went, pulled over. And he goes, just like this, young blood. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, bro. But God damn! And then he got in his car and drove off. I couldn't even be mad. Other than her ass is like, wow. <laughs> Woo! It's like that and like this and like that and uh, I couldn't even get mad. So she got pregnant. She got pregnant. We were, we were happy. This and that. A lot of people. It was the neighborhood I grew up. So a lot of the mothers and the kids I grew up with were kind of pissed off because this woman's 10 years, almost 10 years older than me. She's cradle robbing. She already got a family. It was a lot of friction, <laughs> but we didn't care. We yeah. didn't care. So I'm driving. She woke up. She goes, I, I, the water broke. So we're driving. We get in the car. We just got on 580 freeway. And she goes, I'm having this baby. And I said, no, it's cool. We on our way. She said, no. And I reached between her legs and I felt the crown of her head. So, dude, oh my God. she's panicking. So I don't know how I stay calm. She's like, ah! I said, just relax. I can drive and deliver, baby. It's all good. And I pulled her and I'm pulling her. She came out to her shoulders. Then she drove on the floor of the car and made a splat. Then her mama just lost it. The baby's on the floor. The baby's on. I said, well, baby, I'm still driving. Pick the baby up. It's all good. So, man, we, we made it to the hospital. In fact, on her birth certificate, it says place of birth, 580 freeway. Attending physician Donald Lacey, BD, baby's dad, daddy. True story. <laughs> True story. Oh, That's before God. baby's daddy became popular, bro. So I kind of oh jumped that off, right? So then, man, it was so much pressure <laughs> from everybody. And then some dudes hated on me. I was in college, said I was, you know, had a whole bunch of girlfriends. I come home. My daughter's about three now, two, not quite three. She put my stuff on the, uh, she put my stuff on the, uh, porch booted me out and to this day she always said if i'd have known the kind of man you were i would have never did that who knows anyway we broke up but i was still very prevalent in my daughter's life a couple of years later i got married to a wonderful woman we had two kids and it was like you know first it was friction between her and my wife but then we all got along my daughter came and lived with us for a while went to school because we moved to marin because we wanted the kids going to the great school and she was just this Man, so I gave her the name Loishe, which is Igbo and Nigerian and means love life in English. And her middle name is Adama, which means daughter of beauty. And you can see how beautiful, but man, she was like, she was incredible, dude. She had like my personality times 10. She was a peace Aww. activist at her school. She was a conflict resolution mediator, which means like with the Latino and the black kids got into a beef, she would bring her and everybody loved her. And I got this oh great God. picture of her. She has this uh, Latino kid and this black kid and putting their hands together and they, they made peace. So Holy anyway, God. man, summer of 1970, I'm in LA working a lot. I didn't want my family down there. I go back and forth, got a crib down there. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm writing for BT, not just Comic View, but I'm writing for the station for drops for this, uh, this, uh, this uh, like TCM thing they started where they show classic black movies. It never, it only lasted like two years, whatever, whatever. I'm doing good, man. <clears throat> uh, I, I I had a development deal with Quincy Jones that my manager squashed to the, wow. but that's a whole nother story, bro. I don't even want to get into him. God bless him. I had to, speaking of forgiveness, I had to do that because uh, I was in the Barry Black Comedy Competition finals and they always say, everybody said, it was almost a riot when I came in second. Uh, people were throwing stuff at the winner, right? And I killed it, killed it. So Quincy Jones Entertainment, Stacy Matthews is her name. She's an agent now. Yeah. That's right when Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was about to jump off, right? 
Oh my God. She saw me and said, dude, I love your comedy. We want to do a showcase for you, bro. And uh, at the time I was the host on Tuesdays at the improv, uh, 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 the improv in Santa Monica. They used to have one. My, Roger Mosley, who just passed away, rest in peace, came and saw me, had right, me doing dude. shows in Hawaii. I'm digressing. So anyway, um, uh, summer of 97, I come back home. I go by my daughter's house and her and my, uh, her cousins, my nieces, uh, they're crying. I said, what happened, baby? She said, this friend I, I know got murdered. And she said, uh, hmm. She said, I want to do something, daddy. I said, well, what do you want to do? She said, man, I want to, I'm tired of seeing all these kids get killed. I want to, I want you to help me write a play. We got to, we got to put more love in the hood, you know, and I was hugging her and we was proud. She was crying. I was crying. We had prayer. So anyway, that was summer of 97. I go back to LA. I'm going into the Melrose Improv and I get this, we didn't have cell phones back in. We, I get this 911, 911 page from my wife. Oh my and I'm God. like, fuck, because I should always tell people, hey, man, don't page me 911. It's like, bring some food, bring some bread, um, make it 611. That was our thing. So I knew something was fucked up. So I don't know if it, they don't have that there anymore, but they used to have this phone booth in that parking lot in the Melrose Improv, right? Mm -hmm. And I went in there and I called. I got a bunch of chains and I called and she was crying and she couldn't talk for like 10 minutes or oh more. And I was like, baby. And then she said, Loisha is dead. I was like, dude, I tore up the phone book. I didn't even finish talking to her, bro. I ran up and down Melrose. I was just fucked up. I almost pulled the dude out of his car because he said, hey, you idiot, get out the fucking road. And I grabbed his door and I was beating on and I said, you know, I'm not mad at dude, right? Right. So anyway, oh. I called, went back to another phone booth. That's funny, they don't even have phone booths anymore. But I called Laura Hayes one of the queens of comedy, who's my best friend in life, unequivocally, just a cold, beautiful human being. I want you to meet her, dog. She's so dope. She would love, love to meet me. her. Love to meet her. And her love and her me. husband, who's passed away since, man, they watched over me that night, bro. And I was just on her phone calling everybody. And everybody was like, hey, dog, we think we know who did it. It was four people involved. And I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to be back in Oakland tomorrow. Don't do shit till I get back, because I want to be there. I want to pull the fucking trigger on these assholes, whoever the fuck it is. And then I was up all night, seven o'clock that morning. I called my grandmother, her great grandmother, who's Church of God in Christ. And she said, what the devil meant for evil, God was going to turn to good. And right then, man, I could hear my daughter when she told me I want to do something positive. So I put the word out. Don't touch them dudes. Fuck that. We ain't, we ain't gonna, we gonna make something positive come out of this, man. And then the Love Life Foundation was born that night. Then we just, we did a march on her birthday a few months after she was killed. It was over 2,000 people, bro, in the middle of the hood where she was killed right across from a climate. We walked for oh my, we God. went through what was ghost town where the killers were from. Yeah. People were coming out of their houses. Man, it was like a flash. Van Jones, I didn't know till years later, was there that night right? Until we did the TV special. So we were on the news almost every day, bro. And it, it gained all this attention because she was a beautiful lady that wasn't no gang banger and was doing all this good shit. So it touched a nerve. So then I stopped my show bitch shit. I'm saying, man, I got to make some good happen. I was like, focus, bro. Yeah. Laser. I didn't care about comedy, acting, writing, none of that shit. So we were on the news so much. Christmas Eve, Eve, December 23rd, 1997. I'll never forget. I get a call two o'clock in the morning, the investigator goes, we have a confession. Go there the next morning, pull up to the police station, news cameras from everywhere, bro. CNN, ABC, NBC, everywhere. Oh my God. We go upstairs for an hour and he's telling me this kid, and I can say his name now because he's been on TV, Christopher Smith confessed. He knew your daughter. He didn't know she was sitting, what had happened. They were, she was coming from her job at McDonald's with a young lady who her mom took in, who she known since she was a baby. They were waiting at the bus stop and the kid saw them, gave them a ride. And my daughter sat behind the driver. But what they didn't know, this dude had gotten to some funk with some ghost town people and they was looking for him. So sometime between the time they picked them up and the time they stopped around the corner from her house, them dudes caught him, walked up on the van, four of them, right? In ski masks, shooting at him, let off about 50 rounds. He ducks, 
daughter caught seven bullets, dies instantly, right? So oh my, my whole God. thing was, okay, no, we're gonna make, we're gonna, we're gonna make something good happen, man. So, but then the kid confessed, and I thought, wow, he must have a conscience because he didn't know she was in the back seat. I said, one day I'm gonna meet this kid. And then we go to court, right? Yeah. And they give him 25 to life. And I was kept trying to get dude to look at me because I was trying to see if I, do I remember this kid when he came to the house when they were little. And um, so years and years went by. Then I started, man, I was uh, I was so focused on, I'm not going to let this shit because everybody in the family was fucked up. Even my father, who's the strongest dude I knew in my life. Great dude, man. He was, he's like, son, I'm devastated. So I was like, fuck this. Uh. I'm not going to grieve. I didn't cry at her funeral. I went on like this for years and I was doing this play about Jonestown, Jim Jones, right? Yeah. And I'm acting in this play and the character I'm playing has to identify his dead sister. And they had a dummy and a sheet on us gurney. Oh, and I remember shit. I was going to scene and I looked up and I saw my daughter like I saw her on the slab. And this other actor, buddy of mine, I wonder how he's doing. He was, uh, I blacked out. I let out some kind of scream that he said, stop the whole play. And it was like, then I realized this was 10 years after she was killed. Then I realized, damn, I got, I need counseling, man. I'm fucked up. I haven't dealt with my grief. And my father told me early in the game after she died, he said, son, grief is like a, a, a tab. Sooner or later, you're going to have to pay the bill. And the longer you wait, the harder that bill is going to be to pay. So then I started getting help for myself, bro. And then I had slowly started getting back. So, but I always said, I want to meet this kid, man. I want to find out why these dudes shot 50 times or whatever. What was the shit about? And then I got into this restorative justice program because there was this famous murder, uh, Lacey Peterson. Remember that? Yeah. Man, Scott, Peter, Peterson. Scott Peterson. Right. Amber, right. Amber Killed Pryor's her girlfriend. Her. Yeah, yeah. I know all about pregnant. it. Dude. And I remember, man, I was asked to come speak. This is a couple of years after my daughter was killed. And I remember, and I hope she's okay. I remember seeing her mother and her mother was so angry and bitter and I in her face. And I was like, God, and you could just see. And I was like, God, I don't want to be that. Cause it, I, I pray that lady is all right. Cause if you have this shit all day, it'll fucking kill you, man. So I had to I had to go through a lot of shit, man. I started practicing qigong, which I still do every day. It saved my life, man. I was in such a dark hole about 10, 12 years ago, dude. I was really is that like meditation? Ending. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was contemplating killing myself. I really was. And as God would have it, I went to Jamaica and learned qigong. Never thought about that since. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What's qi no. qigong? Qigong. Qigong is this ancient thousands of years old breathing practice and bro in fact when I co i'm coming to la in a couple of days man we're gonna get together i'm gonna teach oh, you yeah. bro. oh thank you I everybody we in the food. world because it makes it makes all this shit out here not affect you as much bro it's like fuck that shit it makes you it makes you closer to the universal energy bro and it's all breathing that's all it is and it saved my life man it got me out of the dark hole depression the harmful thoughts so Right around that time I come back, I start the, this is around 2012, I start the restorative justice process where people who are offended by somebody, if they murder somebody in your family, you get a chance to sit down with them and have a dialogue and whatever comes out, come out. If you want to say, fuck you, motherfucker, if you want to fire on them, whatever, it comes out. Yeah. So I went through that for about three, four years. I was supposed to meet dude. And then I changed my mind, bro, because all the anger and shit came up. I was like, man, I fuck this dude. I don't want. Then I was at oh a picnic God. for McClyman's, uh, where she was a student, a uh, reunion picnic. And this kid comes up to me and say, hey, Mr. Lacey, we love and appreciate all the good shit you're doing in the neighborhood, bro. But Chris wants to meet you. He really wants to meet you, bro. And then I got back in the restorative justice again. And as fate would have it, a year or two in, I get a call from Van Jones's people and they go, hey, we got this new show called The Redemption Project and we want you to be on it. And then I thought, then the restorative justice people who didn't know them were like, well, you gotta meet Chris first. And I was like, no, when I meet him for the first time, I want the cameras here. I want the world to see, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I want the world to see this. I was contemplating forgiving dude, but I wasn't sure I could do it. So 
we, all this goes on. We have production meetings. It's a week before the thing. I told my wife, I said, I just woke up real angry. I said, fuck that dude. I'm not going to do it. And then, bro, I swear to you, and only two people in the world know this story, <laughs> including my wife and a dear friend of mine. I was up one night. I fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> And I woke up in the middle of the night and I could hear my daughter's voice like we're talking. And she said, forgive him, daddy. And then I went and did it, bro. And then I sat there with your boy, talked to him about four or five hours. There's a lot of shit that came out. Because the first question I asked, they didn't show this in the TV show. Uh, I said, hey, man, what, what the fuck was that about, bro? And he didn't know. They had to cut, bro. I put a hole in the wall at San Quentin. I, I threw a chair. I just exploded. And it was real tense and fucked up. So it, we had to take a break. 45 minutes later, I calmed down and then we started talking again. But he really, I believe him. He didn't really know. He was, in fact, I found out later, he was just walking and they were on the way to do that dirt, as they say, to kill dude. Right. And they say, hey, young blood, we got some, you want to be down with the click? You need to go come with us to do this dirt. And they just swooped him up. He didn't know who, what, when, where. So finally, man, I said those magic three words. And I wasn't sure I could do it till it came out of my mouth. I said, I forgive you, man. And respond, man, I get, I've gotten some emails and instant messages on Facebook and people telling me some fucked up stories. So I'll never, this oh. pregnant lady, eight months, her husband beat the shit out of her, threw her down the stairs. Oh my the God. Baby, the baby has had issues, right? Baby, of course, the baby's having issues. Oh I forget, like, I don't know what, some kind of mental issues or whatever, of course. Oh, poor and she kid. said, poor I woman. never thought I could forgive this piece of shit. But after I saw what you did for your daughter, I'm thinking about it. And, you know, wow. I was like, wow. So then I realized, man, what I always knew, the way she was born, the way she died and everything that's happened. Now here we are, and I didn't tell this part, Love life is the official motto of Oakland. Every entering Oakland sign says love life. So that, that ain't nothing but God, man. People say, you deny, I can't take the credit. It was her spirit. That was her mission. To come here for 16 years and eight months and remind us all to love life. So that's, <laughs> she wasn't even 17. She was 16, she, bro. 16 and, and eight and, months. Yeah, and that's... the cold part about it is, and this is the honest to God, it's true. While I lost one, bro, I've got thousands, man. I got so many wonderful youngsters I've helped get through college. They got kids. Man, <laughs> I'm a blessed awesome. dude. You know, and I wouldn't, there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do to have my daughter back because me and her were like, Phew. so yeah, man. In fact, we're having the 25th anniversary gala, November, bro. And if, you, if you're in Oakland, November 12th, man, come through, man. It's going to be amazing. 25 year anniversary, man. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm back to my career and have been for the last, well, color struck kind of started it, uh, 15 years ago. I started touring that around. Thank God. Cause I don't make money from love. I was even rumors going around. I'm making money off of my daughter. That's bullshit, man. Oh my God. I would have never even fucking thought of it like that, man. Well, you know, salty motherfuckers, but we ain't never had a budget. <laughs> Wait, hold up a second. Our no, average I, budget, bro. I ain't got nothing high. Our average budget for love life a year is 65000 Okay. And 80%, 70% of that money goes to the kids and their families. We give them money. We help them. Yeah. I never had a salary, nor do I want to. I've had to hustle for mine. Yeah, it's affected my marriage. It's affected a lot of my personal life, but I don't care. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. So, Brother, I mean, like... All the people that you've helped, bro, you've helped me, man. Like, it, 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 my my best friend was murdered 14 years ago, dude. It's hard to talk about. I would never trivialize my situation. With I never knew that, situation. bro. Yeah, and it, I don't tell people that shit because it's hard. And then, 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 for, and then, and then, people my generation, oh, well, oh, so you're just a bitch. You're gonna right. cry, uh, yeah, because I love that. What? So that makes me a faggot now? Fuck you. Right. You're the one that wants to suck dick if you want to give me a title like that. Just because nobody's ever told you they love you. Because you exactly, gotta, bro. You gotta pay bitches to say that they love you. Fuck you. I don't pay shit, motherfucker. My love's real. 
So I like, hey, you man, know what I mean? Before I forget, <laughs> man, before I forget on that, I'm glad you said that, bro. Is your mom still alive, bro? Yeah, she is, brother. Hey, like, man, I'm going to go visit when her. When we finish this, do me a favor, bro. Call yeah. your mom and say she did a good job raising you, brother, because you got a heart. And that's why we always connected, because I always saw people were scared of you. I wasn't scared of you. I walked right up to you. I was like, <laughs> okay, Donald. Because, you know, okay. I know you be mugging and people get scared. They're like, man. That, that I wasn't me mugging. Was that was my why look. Fuck, somebody told me, why do you fuck with Victor? He's a scary son. I said, man, you don't even know, dude, bro. You're dude. judging on what your scary oh, shit is. Oh, that hurts my feelings. And see, this is why I'm fucking losing weight, motherfucker. <laughs> God damn it, sorry, my bad. Like, I like it's like hold on the series where I was just I seriously, I seriously took down my notes. I was like, I don't give a fuck. No yeah, man, tell your don't mom matter. that for me, bro. Don't no, forget. No, no, tell listen, your mom that listen, for me, bro. I, I'll take it a step further. I tell her to her face because I need to see her because she's 71. There you go. She's 71. Now. I got I gotta make time for her. I gotta go see her. Get yeah, now. Soon yes, this sir. weekend, maybe because I got to work Thursday and Friday because I, I got a substitute teacher in the hood, bro. And like, you know, it's just like, and I love motivating those kids and letting them know, hey, you can do it. I did it. People said that I couldn't do it. People said I was stupid. They actually said worse words than that. My Man. own teachers, my own teachers didn't believe in me. You got to believe in yourself. And, you know, Real I talk. tell and these you know kids, what, bro? That, man. I'm happy for you, bro, because the sweetest victory is when you prove people wrong. That is, that is, that, 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 that is 100% factual. And you know what? Hearing behind the scenes stories, all due respect, they painted your story way softer than it was. They should have thrown you short. But you know what, though? They were probably thinking, you know, if we show up angry black man throwing a chair, exactly, that's going to, you know, it's just, and you know, I'll do respect. No, no, no. But, that's I, real but talk. It, like real talk, like, I, 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 because listen, like, it's so fucked up. Every time a crime happens, I'm like, Please don't let it be a spick. Please don't let it be a beaner. Please don't let it be a wetback. Please, for the love of God, don't let it be or a fucking, you know, spickeroonies. Leave it, please, just anybody <laughs> else. Spickeroonies, I never heard that. <laughs> Listen, when you're a fucking thick spick named Vic, you know, and you go through fucking <laughs> personal tragedies and shit, all right? You got to be funny to get pussy, bro, when you're me, all right? And, <laughs> You gotta be funny to to be to get friends when when you're me, bro. Just friends. People, like, I only sound like an asshole, but fuck, man. <laughs> you're only funny because you're fat and you scream your punchline. Suck my fucking fat spick dick. How about those particular apples? Because for reals, man, I could have a fucking serious end to the conversation at the same time. You know why? Because it's all from the heart, oh, and I shit. fucking love you, and I respect the fuck out of you, and I'm just like, listen, and I, I, and I got questions, comedy advice, fuck all that shit. This is more important. You know why? It's my fucking show. Hey, you know bro, what? I gotta that, say, that, uh, yeah, your show is the bomb, man. I saw, Thanks, brother, dude, for I real. I saw the whole interview. You know, uh, Cheech and Chong and them was some of my role models, man. <laughs> and when you had Tommy on, boy, and the cold part about it. When he started talking about racism and, and colonialism, and I mean, that shit got deep, bro. I was like, I was like, I'm gonna be real with you first. I was like, okay, I'll watch the first half hour or whatever. I got shit to do. But bro, you changed my schedule that day. That shit was about two hours, dog. And I watched the whole thing. Two hours and five minutes, the first episode. Was, like, I watched yeah. the whole thing, bro. bro. I know that I was so actually deep. surprised. I was surprised he reached out about that. I was just like, bro, you did a good dude, job. Dude, that's when I hit you and dude. said, bro, that shit was epic. Dude, because like for he real. He's a legend of yeah, the game, bro. I, I, I and a good dude. A real good dude, dude. A real good dude. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And then fucking asked somebody recently, hey, we do my podcast. They're like, oh, I got to think about it. And I looked them up Whatever. and I was just like, dude, you fucking jerk. Anyway, it didn't hurt my feelings. Like, <laughs> I got real shit going on in my life. Like talking to my homie and talking about how you overcome traumatic events by getting help by trained professionals because you don't fucking know it all. Trained professionals, that's what they fucking do all day. That's so right. you gotta trust them and you gotta fucking really just, you know what? You know, you know what it, it you think it's balls to not talk to anybody about your fucking problems. Don't just talk to trained professionals then. Call, call 911, say, hey, I'm feeling fucked up. If you can't drive, or even better, if you can drive, just, just go to the emergency parking and then tell them what's just, just, hey, I'm really not feeling good. And 
check yourself in just nice and confidentially. And, and, and guess what? The only person that's going to snitch on you is going to be a fucking nurse or a doctor that works there that knows you personally, unless your stupid ass checks into that hospital. All right. So don't, so don't check in that hospital. You fucking attention horse, <laughs> attention seeking motherfuckers, because like this <laughs> for reals, it's like I'm at the hospital. It's, then they have the wristband on. It's like, what happened? It's like, say what happened. It's just like right. I'm doing a, I'm doing a fucking uh, a, a stool test or, you know, the checking my kidneys out or, you know, I and mean, that also worries people. Like, you know, it's just like, oh, my, my dad needs to take a kidney test because his, his kidneys are 20 percent. And I'm just like, I just bought two bottles of tequila and I'm about to buy two more. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't fucking, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, fuck, man, I really shouldn't do any of this shit. But like, it, it's right. just bad. But I mean, it's just like, but but it's not, I, I didn't mean for it to be self-destructing. It's just I live with chronic physical pain so sometimes you got to drink so it's just right. like it's pretty fucked up but you know that's besides man, the that's point. What you just made me realize black and brown people have that in common man we never want to admit we're fucked up because you know i was raised by the macho dudes my uncle my dad and don't you cry boy yeah don't I mean, you that's cry pussy shit. don't be no sissy da, 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 da. but man everybody needs help bro and yeah. i'll say when the first professional I didn't get to, she was a white woman, no offense, but I wasn't feeling old girl after one session. I was like, and she goes, so when our next session, and I politely told her, I don't think I'll be back. And she goes, what's the problem? I said, I don't think, I didn't want to tell her. You white man, but I didn't want to do that. But, I, <laughs> I, I, but it, was, it, was, it was like, she was kind of condescending. And then she was like projecting oh, how God. black people feel. That's when I went and got a sister and she was hella cool. Cause I was like, man, nah, Cause sometimes it ain't a good fit. So if you if no, I feel get, you do. If you I get feel. help, get help, but make sure it's a good fit for you. Ooh, you know that's a good t- dude, Donald. That's solid advice because, like, dude, there's okay. For the record, mental health care is shit unless you have private insurance. End of story. If you don't have private, and not just Kaiser, Kaiser's not private. Any asshole could get that shit. Yeah, 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 you know, so so yeah, yeah. Right here, we got Donald Field. Nah, nah, that oh. was my boy. My <laughs> local local Sean San Jose. I just had to tell him I'm gonna call him back. No, no, but the way he says, hey, bro. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 man. Hey, your hey, podcast hey, is dope. Hey, I've been hey, on hey, several, bro. Yeah. But your shit is dope, bro. Well, yeah, bro. I'm proud I'm, of you, bro. Oh, well, I'm thanks, proud brother. of you. Hey, well, hold, hold on. on you, bro. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Then you know what? Then we're gonna switch it back. Hold on, we're gonna switch it back to my podcast instead of the talk show. <clears throat> For the record, BD baby daddy on the birth certificate is fucking hysterical. True story. I, I had to write that down. And then 580 freeway place of birth. <laughs> that's fucking funny. <laughs> that's really funny. It was just like one of those things. I was just like, all right, don't Man, say one day that story's the whole story is going to hit the big screen soon, bro. Bro, I'm and, very uh, I'm going to give you with... some kind of cameo in it, bro. Just <laughs> I Whatever. I don't yes. even care if you're like the Mexican at the door. <laughs> at the club or whatever, bro. Maybe I'm security. Gonna a, I'm gonna give you at least one or two lines, bro. Oh, you oh, word you're is too bond. Kind. You're too kind. No, word you're is bond. I'm oh, saying I love it on you. Your no, 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 I appreciate it. Yeah, no. Word well, is I, bond. I, well, you know, well, I always keep my word. Well, let me let's let's keep this word short because you know what, brother, you're part Mexican. You got <laughs> it. You, you're part I Mexican. was in Fresno County Jail. <laughs> Listen here, okay, okay, man. <laughs> That was just in Fresno. You fuck up all right there in Fresno. And like you had to do what you had to do to get by, man. And, and bro, you're a fucking professional actor, man. So like Come if you eh? mira aquí, cabrón. Don't you fucking Come on. Don't you... this, Mendes. <laughs> it's Pacheco, hey. Bro. Eh? Hey bro, you <laughs> yeah, know this yeah, as a up, Mexican, bro. bro. Yeah. I don't know why, but that blood in blood out movie is like the Godfather. Dude, uh, okay, listen, I gotta tell you something, and this is a secret between. Okay, listen, this is you're the worst person to tell the secret to, and I'm gonna say it right now. Say because, it. Okay. Okay. Donald, you know that movie Color Struck you were in, and you know how it's like very popular with Mexicans. I never seen it. Ah, uh, oh, you know, the dude. most hold on the most part of the movie I saw was to watch you hilarious. That's, that's the only part. And if you want to talk about, let's talk about it. If not, let's not, because I just want for reals and I'm not putting you on the spot. You see, the thing is, it's just like we're keeping it real. And it's just like this was one of my questions, because like and you're like, hey, whatever, if you want to bring it up, bring it up. Like, Fuck it. Let's go deep. 
because uh, or if you want to do a part two, let's do a part two. But you, but but if you don't want to do part two and you're just like Victor, that was already too much. Why the fuck do you keep asking me questions after that? Bro, if you want me to do part shit. two, we'll do part two. We'll do part two. Okay, listen, check this out. Hold on one second. Hold on, let me let me get back to being a professional. <laughs> hold on let me just uh, i gotta ask you one question because this is gonna be too much later okay let me ask you okay what are, what are your thoughts about the chris rock and will smith oscar debacle and yeah. has, has it affected comedy will it affect comedy what have you seen what do you know what do you say bro sorry i, that was I that. even do i even do fuck it i ain't got nothing and i don't know how long i've been doing it but ever since this happened I do this opening joke and then I say, I say, I hope it's not my intent uh, to offend anybody. Uh, I never want to offend anybody, but if by chance any one of you people is offended and you're thinking about running up on stage and doing a Will Smith and slapping the shit out of me, be advised I'm from Oakland and I'm strapped. So I use, that's how I do in the opening <laughs> of my set. So that's I think it was ridiculous. I think it was yeah. fucked up. You think it was I stage? Think, uh, you're an actor. You think that was staged? Real nah, talk, real nah, spaghetti. You know, I, at first I did, but a friend of mine who works for the Hollywood Press Association yeah. was there. She was there, and she told me you could hear the shit. She was like 30 feet from it. She said you could hear that shit echo. No, he really slapped the shit out of him. And, um, you know, Jesus. whatever, man. But in terms of how it affects comedy, I don't know if that so much, but that we live in this whole politically correct Watch what you say. And comedy can't be about that, bro. Right, dude. Comedy's got to be no holds barred. If you can't take a fucking joke, keep your bitch ass at home. How about but, that? But that's the thing, though. People say that you got no right to say that. And fuck them. But my point is this. Listen, they can suck my spig dick and your black hack. So, like, um, ah! you can have that one. You can have that. I swear to God. Hey, Don. I, 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 for the record, hey, man, I didn't know appearing on this show would give me a blowjob. Let's go. I'll, be, <laughs> I'll do part two, three, and four for that. Listen, hey, listen, that's yours. And then you add whatever tags you want, baby. That's, that's I'm married. That's... Who, who's heard of a blowjob? But anyway, no, 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 no. Well, tell, tell her not to listen to the Poppycock podcast with Donald Lason. I think episode 21 or 22. I don't remember. I, you know, shit happens. You know, I fucking not, but, 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 but we're, uh, close. we're close to the promised land. No, but yeah, I, I think just it was just a bad luck. We're episode 23, baby. Sorry, I had to double check. We're episode 23. Sorry for confusing yeah. people. I should have been like, hold on one second. But, you know, I, I, I'm my, my producer's not here in studio today. So um, it's just bad. I had to do it manually. So, you know, sorry, I had to do some peasantry during my own pa my, my own show. But um Sometimes that's how you get it done. But this is episode 23, uh, yeah. Donald, dude, uh, I really admire you for all the work that you've done. If, if, you, if you've seen Donald in movies or his stand up in real life, like just go to his shows. It, it, it's a blessing. Go see Colors Struck. And uh, where else can the people find you? Like put out the. Hey, man, I'm actually going to be in. Uh la this week doing shows at comedy chateau and it's your tuesdays i might just roll by there to watch you get down at the uh in long beach bro i'll be in town oh, are dude. you just coming to not this tuesday this week but next week yeah it's second and fourth so i'm actually okay, there bet. next week yeah i'm coming through bro. oh let me, let me try to get you a spot then that'll be dope let me either try way, to get you I'm there either way bro. yeah i'm gonna confirm with that when we get off the phone right now Whatever you said you're going to do for me, I don't remember who gives a shit. Um, I'm going <laughs> to... Ah! Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, no, no. It was too, you're too generous. Hey, man, was, but don't yeah. forget to tell no. moms what I said, yeah, dog. Yeah, man. Muy importante, vato loco. Yeah, papi. Yeah, dude. Well, you know, well, no, man. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad you stand by that statement even after all this. And my heart goes out to you. And, like, I just want to also just point out for the record, Donald Lacey is proof that, oh, I had a shitty day and, you know, you got to turn into a fucking bad. You know what? Donald Lace is proof right here that not only can, can, can you live life and be an advocate and advocate for people that you love and, and, and honor the memory, you could do it peacefully and make other people happy in the process. But Donald's I really know, extra talented and extra blessed when it comes to making people laugh. Like holy shit! I appreciate shit. you, bro. Like brother, you you you're you you're one of the few cats that I met off top. So I was just like, 
okay, if you're really a headliner, why are you so nice? And then I was just like, oh, wait, that was just me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's Donald. All good, no, baby. no, Donald really is a sweetheart. He does shake hands. He's he's a very formal dude. Like, I mean, hold on. This I don't know about since the pandemic because I've noticed that hey, everybody gets fist, fist, fist bump, bump, bump. Baby. Ah, you know what's funny? I posted my we did that at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> listen, all right. I would hit you up after this because listen, otherwise there's gonna be a five hour episode. But I, we gotta get Hilarious. a part two. Hey We're man, gonna get a part I had two. a blast, listen, bro. Yeah, when I brother. Do these, this is the most fun I've had on a podcast ever, and I'm not just blowing smoke, bro. Bro, it was well, a real conversation, you know. Well, yeah, bro. Well, that's how I do, try to do with all my guests. I research them, and I'm just like, wait. How much research do I gotta do for us, for us, for us? Because I already know all this, and fucking, I just need to do the fucking just bullet points and that's it oh and then here are my fucking questions i wanted to ask but fuck that we'll do that some other time because you know oh, this, good, this, this was this was the deep episode hey this show is yeah it, it, it's already you got a sponsor thanks to the sponsor i want to say but bro, oh, dude, this, I, this show I, is gonna blow up i hope so man and i hope it isn't like after i die because that'd be really <laughs> fucked up you know what i mean it's just like oh yeah well this guy was hilarious let's check out his podcast and it's hey, like man, on well, reddit and it blows you're up you're not gonna die for a long time i hope but you're if, right if some if for some strange reason i'll live you it's gonna be i'm gonna do for you what you're gonna do for you. it's a conspiracy <laughs> they put something in his microphone bro <laughs> He was killing the game. Oh he was my telling God. too much truth. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> okay, I need to tone down my fucking truths. Bro, <laughs> no, bro, be, people, keep being you, bro. Dude, yeah, and 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 you know what, man? I, I've learned a lot from you, and I still keep learning, so thank you for being so generous with your advice, information. Thanks for keeping it real on my show, because like I said, you know, it, it's more than the podcast. It's, we do, I do whatever the fuck I want. You know what I mean? You're my homie, so you do whatever the fuck you want. So let's fucking chill. That's what the podcast is about. Hey, bro, I'm, so it's, it's an just, honor. So it's just privilege like, to be on your show, yeah, bro. brother. I, I hope you come I back. I want to say this, bro. Yeah, brother. Yeah. I'm well, proud of you, man. Dude. Every once in a while, you got to pat yourself on the back and realize <laughs> I've been in L.A. for a fucking year. I've met some interesting. I had fucking Tommy Chung on my oh, show. Jesus Christ. Not once, yeah. but twice for yeah. hours and hours. Bro, do you realize how good you're doing? I don't care what people might think or Dude. say. You're doing good, bro. So keep it up, well, eh? I, I really do appreciate that. And I'm trying my hardest to do it. Like, I, I woke up at 6 a.m. and I recorded a podcast at 9 a.m. already. There it is. So that's why I was just like, okay, Don, remember, uh, I, I sent that message to everybody sounding like a loser. I'm like, hey, I got a daytime job and I'm just giving up Monday. I don't give a fuck. I don't fucking care. I'm recording podcasts on Monday. But thank God it was with you, though, when you were one of them, because I was just like, I already know Donald Lacey. So this is fucking going to be just a good talk. I already knew it. I knew it. I knew it was going to be fun. And I was like, fuck, yeah, I get to see his ass, too. I'm like, ah, right on, from, dog. You're looking you good, to, yeah, boy. Bro. So, you know what I mean? It's you just might like, need the bodyguard to keep some of these hoes off of you. Get the player. fuck out of here. <laughs> that was a nice compliment. I need to use that clip. That's a good clip. That's a good clip. <laughs> Yeah, because you're, you're funny I, as fuck, too. I wish you were See? my doctor who, when, when my mom, when I was born, you know, you, you fucking knew with the perfect <laughs> clip. That's the perfect clip right there. Uh, anyway, no, that would have, uh, trying to do a circumcision joke. It didn't work out. But anyway, they all can't be, they're just like, they're just like my students, bro. No matter how hard I try, they all can't be winners. Because, yeah, you, know, it, bro. you know, hey, even, even James Brown, who had more hits than anybody, had a few misses, <laughs> bro. Do we all we all we, we yeah we all swing and miss sometimes but hey man <laughs> however you acknowledge it or try to overlook and pretend it never happened but you know I try not to do that but you know point being is dude Donald I appreciate your authenticity hey, right on man and it's I appreciate your honor, time bro, I this. and so hey bro if I could get you back again if I can't then you Whenever. know what it's a star no, anytime don't say bro. that don't say that anytime, you'll be you'll be a and fucking I'm not, week and I'm, you'll be and a I'm weekly regular you. you'll be a weekly no, regular anytime, Ooh, bro Ooh. and I'm gonna see you in a few days that's yeah. Safe. Okay, we're gonna learn oh. Qigong. <laughs> Send me the clip or whatever you want translated, so I can oh, actually. Sure. If you got video, that'd be. I want to do that for real. I actually, would. You I know would what? love the challenge of that. Oh, the challenge! You, you yeah, just, just to do, do it in it. another language, eh? Bro, hey, Poppy, you could do it real good. You could do it real smooth, like you know, like real, like, and then get into deep 
cultural colorism. You know what? I don't want to fucking reveal shit. I'm going to get the fuck off the fucking podcast. I'm I'm kicking myself off my own podcast because I don't want to <laughs> reveal anything. I'm going to call you. Uh, call me right now because also I can't find my cell phone. These are my homie. And you know oh, my good. number. Call me hey, right man, now. Hey, man, I got a, I, hey, I got a two o'clock, but let's, let's, let's talk a little later today. Okay, well, no, no, but let me find my cell phone. Call me right now. <laughs> oh, real okay, quick. bet. But uh, one minute, just give me one minute. No, I but, got but, you. But, yeah, all right, brother. Thanks, guys, for listening. Hey, much love, family. Yeah, brothers. Thank Taco you, Donald. Locos forever. Hey, Poppy, please call me. I'm looking for my cell phone. I Thanks for you. tuning in. Thanks for listening. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, do your boy a favor. Tell your friends. Tell your cool family members. Tell your cool coworkers. Let them know about the podcast and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and be sure to follow me on all social media, Puro Papi Pacheco, and check out my website at hispanictitanic.com for future dates. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.